All right, now that we have learned about the different states of matter, we can focus in on one of those particular states. We're going to focus in on the gases, and we're going to learn about the gas laws. So let's remind ourselves about some of those physical properties of gases. So remember that gases expand to fill their container. So they do not have a defined volume or a defined shape. They will fill any volume that they have available to them, and they will take whatever shape that they have available to them. Okay? The atoms and molecules that are found within a gas have that random motion. So constantly in motion, and there's no attraction between those atoms or molecules. That's why they fill their container, because they're not pulling towards one another like they do in a solid. Now remember, gases are fluids. They are a type of fluid just like liquids. Normally, uh, in the everyday non-scientific term fluid, we think of fluid and liquid being the same word and being equivalent, uh, when in reality they are actually different terms. Because in the scientific world, the chemistry world, gases are fluids, but gases are not liquids. Okay, Fluid referring to the freedom of movement of the atoms and molecules that create it. Okay, so Solids do not have any fluidity. Uh, they, their atoms are locked in a specific place, a crystalline structure, while both liquids and gases, those atoms and molecules have freedom of movement. In liquids, they slide past one another. In gases, they can fly past each other. And remember that gases have very low densities. Remember that density is a measurement of how closely compacted the atoms and molecules are in a substance. Gases have a very low density because there's a lot of space in between those molecules. Lots of empty space. Because of all that empty space, because of that low density, that means that gases can be compressed. So if they are taking up a large volume of space, you can reduce that space and compress those atoms closer together. That is something that is special for gases. Liquids cannot be compressed, but gases can. Okay. With the gas laws, which we're getting ready to start, an important thing to remember is that whenever we measure temperature or we're calculating using temperature within these gas laws, you must use Kelvin. Okay, That's how we're going to measure our temperature. We're going to use Kelvin. So how do we do that? If you are given Celsius in the problem, simply add 273 to it, and that will give you your Kelvin measurement. Okay, and if for some reason you need to convert from Kelvin to Celsius, so if the problem says give the answer in Celsius, you would simply take your Kelvin and subtract 273, and that would give you your Celsius. Okay, uh, this is something you may want to add to your equation sheet. I highly recommend it. That way you will be able to quickly and easily convert between Celsius and Kelvin in the future. All right, next let's talk about pressure. So pressure is force divided by area. Okay. So pressure can be exerted on an object or on gas, okay, and it's force divided by area. So if you take a look at these different shoes, which one do you think is going to create the most pressure, the most downward pressure? Go ahead and think to yourself of what, which shoe you think and why you think that. 
Okay. And these pictures, they're in order. This one creates the most pressure because you have all of the force pressing down on the ball of the foot uh, near the toes. Uh, so that's going to create a lot of pressure because it's over a very small area. The sneakers, they are going to have less pressure because now the full force of your weight is spread out over the full part of your foot, all of your foot, so you're spreading it out, so less pressure. And then these are uh, snowshoes. They create even less pressure because they spread out the force of your weight over a much larger area. And so you can walk on top of snow without sinking in the snow on those uh, because they reduce that pressure. Okay. There are some ways that we can measure pressure. There are barometers. A barometer measures your atmospheric pressure. So this is what uh, newscasters use when they are predicting weather and talking about low pressure areas and high pressure areas. They're using a barometer to measure the air pressure. There are also manometers. These measure contained gas pressure. So if you have a, um, a gas tank that you use to run your grill, or some people even have a propane tank attached to their house if you have um, a gas stove, it will have on it a pressure gauge. And that pressure gauge is a type of manometer. And it measures how much pressure is in that tank to let you know how much gas is available in that tank. Okay, uh, something else to keep in mind as we get ready to do our gas laws is what unit are you going to use to measure pressure? So we said we're going to make sure we keep temperature in Kelvin. So with pressure, we have two options. You can either use kilopascal, which is represented by the KPA, as you see here, or you can use atmospheres, like atmospheric pressure. Uh, some problems are going to give you kilopascals. Some are going to give you atmospheres. You are allowed to work with both of those uh, units within these problems. Okay? So one atmosphere is equal to 101.325 kilopascals. Okay? So if you need to convert between one and the other, you would simply multiply your atmosphere by 101.325 to get into kilopascals. Okay? All right, so now let's get into the gas laws. There are several gas laws we're going to study, total of three. Today, we are going to just learn the very first one, and it is called Boyle's Law, named after Boyle, who is the one who uh, discovered this uh, relationship between pressure and volume and was able to uh, speak eloquently about it and share it with the scientific community. So it was named after him. So Boyle's law states that the pressure and the volume of a gas are inversely related if you keep the mass and the temperature equal. Okay, so pressure and volume are in inversely related. So as pressure goes up, volume goes down. If pressure goes down, volume goes up. Okay, so we can use this information to calculate the changes that occur. Okay, so here is your equation. So let's add this to our equation sheet. P1 times V1 equals P2 times V2. Okay, and if you're making your key to go with it, like I suggested, the P stands for pressure. The units would be either kilopascals or atmospheres. Your V, just like it was before, V stands for volume. And we measure our volume in milliliters or centimeters cubed. Okay. All right, so this one 
this equation we're not able to set up using the triangle method. So we've got to go algebra all the way where we will simply plug in our numbers that we have available and then solve for the unknown. So solve for the x. Okay, so let's do an example problem and see how that's going to work. All right, so here's an example problem. A gas occupies 100 milliliters at 150 kilopascals. Find its volume at 200 kilopascals. Okay, so just like before, let's analyze this problem and see what we already know. So a gas occupies 100 milliliters. I know milliliters is a volume. So I have a volume at 150 kilopascals. Well, we just learned that kilopascals is a type of pressure. So I have a pressure. Okay, find its volume. So that's what I want to know. I want to know the volume at 200 kilopascals. So I have a pressure, okay? So I look at my equation sheet and I see, okay, I have two P's and two V's. What equation do I use? Oh, I use Boyle's Law equation. Okay, so now let's work the problem. Let's plug in the numbers that we know. So here we've got P1, P2, okay? The one simply stands for what you start with, the twos, that's what you end with. So you've got to make sure that you keep the original measurements together and not mix them up, okay? So we know that the 100 and the 150 go together because it's 100 at 150. So those two go together. So those are going to be your ones. And then I'm looking for V2, okay? So just fill in our numbers. So for P1, I'm going to put in my 150. For V1, I'm going to put in my 100. For P2, I'm going to put in my 200. And for V2, that's what I need to know. That's what I don't know. So you can just write V2, or you can, if you're used to that algebra, filling in that X, you can go ahead and put your X in that equation. Okay, now we simply use our algebra skills to solve the problem. So the first thing I can do is I can see that there's no x on this side. So I can just do what it tells me to do, multiply. So I'm just going to do 150 times 100. When you do that, you get 15,000. Keep my units, they're multiplying, so there's not one on top, one on bottom. So we got to keep both of those units, nothing canceled out. Okay equals 200 x. So I still have my x. Okay, that's step one. Step one was to multiply. Next, I got to get that x all alone, right? That's how I solve for x. So you do that by this over here. It's, it's a multiplication, right? 200 times x. So to get that x by itself, you do the opposite and you do that to both sides. So I'm going to divide both sides by 200. When I do that, on this side, 200 kPa divided by 200 kPa, they cancel out. So I can mark those off. They canceled each other out. So on this side, I'm left with just the x. On this side, I have a kPa on the top and a kPa on the bottom. So those cancel out. So I can mark those out. That means on this side, I'm left with 15,000 divided by 200 and I am left with milliliters. So now I just use my calculator. I say 15,000 divided by 200, and I get 75. The milliliters did not cancel out, so I keep those, and that equals x. So now I have solved, so my answer is 75 milliliters. Let me take a look and analyze and see, is that what I was expecting? Was I looking for milliliters? I was looking for a volume, so yes, I was looking for milliliters. If this did not make sense to you and you need more help working through a problem like this, get into contact with me because up next is your independent practice.